Give a round of applause for this panel and for yourselves for making it to the last panel of the ICBC, second one in Berlin. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, our next panel is going to go over cultivation techniques. Very important because without the uh, farmers, without the cultivators, uh, the canvas industry really doesn't go anywhere. So I'm going to introduce the moderator. If you follow uh, Cannabis News Online, you've definitely seen his byline in many German and Amer English publications, including writing for Scentsy Seeds, for Weed Maps at Marijuana.com, and for a little publication called Vice. Please give a warm welcome for Mika Knott. Hello, hello everybody. Thank you for the warm applause. Thank you for the warm welcome. And the panel today, will, or our panel, will be, <clears throat> will be dedicated to growing techniques. With ever tightening regulations and oversight related, uh, related to cultivation, our panel of elite, elite industry scientists and growers will discuss topics uh, ranging from regenerative farming and breeding to organic pesticides and microbiological screening methods as they relate to more stringent and evolving testing requirements. The ICBC invited four, five leading experts, but I have to admit, uh, due to unforeseeable uh, circumstances, uh, we are only uh, four people today. Um, Tom could not come, uh, farmer Tom could not come, and uh, he's, uh, he, lets, he says hello to the audience for the ICBC, and uh, sorry that he could not come. But still, I think we have four leading experts from the growing industry who can give us a very unique or very good insight into the legal cannabis industry um, in the USA, in, in, in Canada. And um, I am proud to introduce like uh, people from, for, uh, from big companies, people from the grassroots movement, people from our growers from the science. It's, not, it's also not only about growing. It's also about uh, science and research about cannabis growing. And I want to start with Pete. Hello, Pete. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us today. Pete is a co-owner of Root RX. It's a recreational marijuana dispensary with uh, six locations across the uh, Rocky Mountains in Colorado. Uh, Pete brings 30 plus years of growing knowledge to his current profession. Uh, from his involvement in operating indoor and outdoor cannabis grows across the country for recreational and medical purposes. He has experience working with traditional and alternative growing mediums and running operations that use both natural and artificial light. In addition to the growing side of the cannabis business, Pete, uh, Pete has deep depth understanding of the retail aspect for managing stores in Aspen and Vail, Colorado. He brings a and relaxed attitude uh, to a high-pressure industry and his, uh, his welcome, welcoming qualities make him an approachable resource for all things about cannabis. And my first question, Pete. Um, in Germany, the regulations for growing in medical cannabis do not allow to grow medical cannabis in greenhouses or even outdoor. Um, according to Colorado requirements, can you fulfill the standards for medical grade cannabis in greenhouses or even outdoor? And how can you achieve that? So we've been growing in greenhouses now since 2014. And what we have found is that in a high-tech, energy-efficient greenhouse, which we now have, that these things are possible. Um, we are regulated by several bodies in Colorado. We're regulated by the Marijuana Enforcement Division, which gives us licensing and sets fines and fees as far as infractions of rules in Colorado. And we're also regulated by the Department of Agriculture at a state level. And we're also regulated by the uh, Health and Safety Department for Colorado. And between these three entities, we have to adhere to very high standards of microbial uh, 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 contaminations, uh, microbial uh, poison as far as uh, pesticides and those types of things. And because this is a, a food stuff, because we're, we're feeding people this and people are inhaling this, we're held to a very high standard. 
And I guess my point being is that in the right uh, greenhouse environment, we can achieve the same level of quality and the same standards that you would in a warehouse. In Germany, I guess we're not, you're, you folks are not able to uh, grow in greenhouses yet, but I see that as an evolution and at some point in the next several years, you're gonna have that opportunity. In Colorado right now, because it is so competitive, there are so many growers uh, in the market, it all gets down to cost. And at some point in time, you're going to realize that uh, greenhouses and outdoor grows for especially oils and extracts and that type of thing are the only way that you'll survive the market. I hope that answered it. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the insight. And um, I think I come to Colin now. Colin, hello, Colin. Colin's co-founder and co-inventor of the uh, of Chief Growth Office and Chief Growth Officer at Gro Growcentia. He's uh, completed his studies in uh, soil microbi microbiologic ecology. Sorry, complicated word for me. And as a research scientist at Colorado University, Colin published dozens of peer-reviewed publications that were focused on <clears throat> microbio by microbio microbial mediated processes that enhance plant growth. Sorry that I have to read that from, from the document. Colin left his academic position at Colorado State University in March 2015 and launched Grossentia. Grossentia is a young startup company in the AG tech sector that develops micro, microbial and soil additives that sustainably increase plant yield across many crops, which in easy words is to say, to say in easy words, uh, you develop products to, uh, that uh, replace fertilizer and that replace uh, um, fair, fair artificial fertilizing and um, fertilizing in general. And so my first question is, uh, I may I ask you to explain that um, in easy words, uh, you replace classic fertilizers and organic nutrition and uh, may I ask you to explain the the basic principle of it. Sure, thanks everyone for being here. As a scientist at the university focused on agricultural and, and soil health and microbial ecology in general, we know as scientists and we know as agriculture specialists that it's critical to deliver nutrients to plants. We know that's really a challenge, nutrient use efficiency in agriculture systems as it is in, can in the cannabis industry. And we started focusing on natural microbial technologies that can maximize the plant's ability to take up nutrients, maximizing nutrient use efficiency for many nutrients so plants can naturally maximize their health, development, quality, and yield. So the goal of our team, we started at the university and now we've bridged and we focus 100% on the cannabis industry, is bringing natural microbial solutions to cultivators so we can naturally enhance plant quality and plant yield, again, using natural processes, which we think is important not only for cannabis, but for all agriculture segments. Okay, thank you, and I'll come back later and uh, to more details. Now I want to introduce Michael. Uh, Michael is Vice President of uh, Conviron, and he's the world-leading designer and supplier of controlled environments for plant growth rooms in the plant research and AG biotech sectors. And you have installed thousands of facilities around the world over the last last decades. Or your company has installed uh, a lot of facility around the uh, within the last years. And uh, you are leading the expansion into the cannabis sector of your company. So my first question to you is: um, How do the regulation for Germany regarding standardization influence the design of cannabis grow rooms in general? Great, thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks everyone for hanging around for this last session. Uh, looking forward to just a few more minutes with you today. Um, one first lesson I learned is have a longer introduction and use bigger words in my intro so that I can match some of these guys here. Um, what, what I wanted to just open up here with was the interesting aspect of the regulations in Germany and their focus on standardization. And that, that reflects that comes back to our company very well because what we're, the way we approach the world of growing and growing cannabis is to provide uh, 
solutions that uh, create environments that really lead to standardized outcomes of plants. And what we see is that the, the level of control is what really drives the outcomes of plants. So if you want standardized results, standardized phenotypes, the standardized uh, chemical outcomes or physical properties of the plants, you really need to zero in on control. And so that control comes from two different aspects. One is really the brains behind the operation, which means the control system itself, and also the body of the grow system, which is all the electrical and mechanical components, the HVAC, and irrigation and fertigation systems as well. And I was trying to explain that to someone in, the, in a situation like this a while ago, and it was like a professional athlete. And that athlete understood it when I said, well, you need the brains that are sharp and adaptive and flexible and robust, but you also need the body with the muscles and the bones that can be responsive to those controls. And so when you put together both the brain and the body, you have a system then that will allow you to control the growth so that you can end up with standardized results, which is really what the German regulations are focused on right now. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Cem, let me introduce you. Sure. And because you're also uh, very involved in environment control as well. Yes. And uh, so uh, Cem is a serial interpreter who, uh, with two successful businesses that were handed over to management, to Sole focus on changing the way the, plan the planet feeds and grows itself. It's a nice bio. And Jem is focusing on uh, patented dehumification, IoT solutions, and other environmental, environmental techno technologies. His goal is making his company, Anamera, a world leading smart greenhouse solution provider for the cannabis industry. And as we talked uh, in advance before, we, before the panel, your whole family is also involved in the greenhouse business. So your whole family is yes. very experienced in the greenhouse business. Yes, we have an agriculture background and uh, we're more focusing on, on cannabis uh, industry now. Exactly. And um, so the cannabis, you're, you're also experienced in other sectors. So my first question to you is, what do you think uh, the biggest impact of tightening regulations in the, is, uh, is, uh, in the industry? Or what do you think is the biggest impact of tightening regulations in this industry? Um, first of all, thanks for having us here on this panel today. Um, I think the, the tightening in regulations uh, pushed uh, growers and uh, consultants in Europe and in the States to be more careful about energy consumption and uh, how, how they design the, the greenhouse, especially water consumption and uh, electricity consumption. Um, it, this is now beginning to have a more of a um, serious uh, law which, which needs to be um, taken care of uh, on a very high level. So as actually Michael said, to standardize uh, the, the way you grow is really important that you, you use innovative ways and best techniques to be able to achieve this. Okay, and when we're talking about standardizing uh, growing, uh, my next question is uh, comes to Pete. In Denver, after the regulation, odor was a regular source for trouble producers, uh, producers had with authorities. I remember that there were a lot of reports in the newspapers. So we do not only talk about a controlled environment, we can, but we also talk about a controlled order neighborhood. So um, is that... Also, uh, how, how can you achieve that, or is that as, as complicated to achieve as a controlled environment, to have the controlled neighborhood, the odor problem? That's a great question, and so uh, folks that are working in urban areas and, and are specifically have grows in urban areas, real challenge, right? Because that technology is just started, and so what we came up with, and I'll, I'll make this a pretty quick answer, was we came up with carbon filters, and we basically designed and implemented these carbon filters on our own. We could have gone to manufactured carbon filters, but it was just cost prohibitive for us to do that. So we came up with designs of our own accord and implemented those designs and created a uh, several uh, carbon filter system to go ahead and mitigate as much odor as possible. Can we get zero odor 
Um, I, I don't know if that's achievable with carbon. I think there is folks in the, in the near future that are going to come up with solutions for odor, but with carbon, I don't know if that's achievable. Um, and the other part of that question, I think, is, is that it's about community outreach, too, at the end of the day. If the folks in your community see you as uh, somebody that's bad, somebody that's doing terrible things to the community, then there's almost a placebo effect of what you're doing. And, and people will say, I smell cannabis. They may not smell cannabis, but they'll say that they're smelling cannabis because it's very easy to go to a local official and say, I smell cannabis. It's almost like I see a communist. So it, it, it has that effect on people. If you go out in the community and you present yourself in a positive manner, if you embrace the community, if you have your local community as part of your, your labor solution, not a challenge, but your labor solution, then all of a sudden they're spending money in the community, they're spending money that they're making in your greenhouse or your growth facility. That, that goes a long way and that has very long legs as far as the people seeing you in a positive light. And when people see you in a positive light, they're always willing to give you a little bit more leeway. So I would, I would say that it's a two-fold answer there. Um, may I ask you an additional question about this topic? Um, I saw in Germany there were some reports about a guy running around with a, with a it, it looked like a big, a big bag in front of his face and he was called the Nasal Sheriff. Is that true? Is, is that existing in Denver? Um, yeah, from the authority, so, somebody with a, with, a, with a machine in front yeah, of his so, face and he, he, he measures the order. Is this yeah, really existing? So, so we do have that in Denver. We've got that actually up by Aspen also. There was a, a greenhouse that was having challenges with odor in Aspen, or right outside of Aspen. And there is a machine that will actually, on some objective level, and I use that, it, it, kind of tongue-in-cheek, uh, measure the smell or the organics in, in the air. But how subjective is that, okay? Um, which way is the wind blowing? How hard is the wind blowing? Did it rain the night before? Is it not rained in five or six days? So there's all kinds of elements to that smell meter, if you will, being accurate. And again, I would suggest you know, doing the best you can with mitigating the smell itself and then also going out in the community and being the best neighbor you possibly can be. And may I add something, Pete, to, to this? Because uh, odor uh, is a big problem in the facilities, especially in public places and Europe. Um, we've been designing a lot of uh, facilities in the middle of the city, in Zurich, for example, in Switzerland, and this is actually a really big problem. So we dived into it a little bit, and now we have great research happening all around the world, actually. There is research on how to trap other. Uh, we also use HEPA and carbon filters. They do work, yep. but to a certain extent, and there is a bunch of other natural ways of trapping odor as well. Yep. Uh, odor is a molecule and uh, we deal with water molecules in air so you can also uh, manipulate this as well. So I believe with companies like yours and, um, and others uh, we're going to get to more sufficient uh, technologies regarding odor trapping. And I, I absolutely agree with that and I would tell people that are looking to get into the industry that ancillary type of companies, uh, you know, there's an old saying in the, the gold mining business that it wasn't the guys that were mining gold that made the money, it was the guys selling the picks and shovels. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest that that is a great place uh, for folks to get involved is odor mitigation because there is probably going to be some water solutions as you alluded to. There's probably going to be some type of ionization solutions out there in the future. So again, this is an evolving industry. Uh, we are on the cutting edge. Uh, the folks that are getting into it now, we're on the ground floor, and there's all kinds of opportunity out there, especially in places like odor mitigation. Okay, thank you very much. And um, now my next question goes to Colin. Colin, you're actually, you're dedicated your research to soil. 
And I read some uh, within the last years. I read a lot of publications, and in some public uh, in some publications, you can read that rock wool or other hydroponic media are more suitable for a controlled environment. Would you agree on that? I'm not sure if I agree or disagree. I know that I visit grows all over the U.S., all through South America, all through Europe, and I've visited hundreds, even thousands of commercial grows, and you know, engage in the industry 100%. That's what I do. I go around and do discovery and learn and try to figure out where there's value to be made and bringing value to growers, commercial growers. There's a lot of commercial growers that are using rock wool in Denver, in you know, Washington State, all over the world. But there's many, many that aren't, and there's trade-offs. And I think you know, there's no one silver bullet solution in agriculture. There's no one silver bullet solution in cannabis cultivation. And there's trade-offs with every decision we make. I think in some cases, one can feel that there is a more controlled aspect to having a very inert substrate or media like rock wool. But I do think that there are some trade-offs with respect to interacting with the plant, to engaging the plant's full phenotypic potential and delivering to that plant what it needs. Many growers, and this is a huge movement, especially through the Pacific Northwest, especially through South America, and more and more even in Europe, People understand, growers understand, that we need to start reproducing soil function and interactions with microbes. And, and these effects really maximize the plant phenotypic potential, meaning not only do we need in today's cannabis industry, and I'll speak of it generally in a global level, to maximize yield, to bring value to growers, but quality comes up everywhere we go now. And yield, although it's very important, Quality has to happen. And you're going to distinguish yourself at a, as a cultivator, and I've heard it from, from growers and consumers here in Germany, through a quality aspect. And so not only is you know, these inputs important, but environment's important and energy's important. All these things that we've, are what we're talking about on this panel are, are interacting to maximize not only plant yield, to bring value to, to farmers, but also plant quality, which is which is critical for distinguishing yourself and, and maximizing the value of your product. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Michael, Colin just told us there are several ways to grow cannabis on several mediums, and you built up dozens of facilities worldwide. Um, it's not only the medium that differs. Uh, how do the facilities differ from each other you build up? Right. Uh, I think what we've seen as we travel around the world and see different facilities is the vast diversity of how people approach designing their facilities. So uh, they're looking at using different technologies and different design configurations. So if we, if we set aside the greenhouse side, which is not my area of expertise right now, but from an indoor growing facility perspective, what we see is vast diversity in the lighting that is chosen, uh, whether that's LED or HPS or other forms of lighting. We see people wanting to have very distinct indoor environments for the different stages of growth of the plants, so from clone to veg to flowering to even drying. And we also want to look at different solutions for how they grow, whether that's hydroponics, aeroponics, in multiple tiers or just in a single tier of, of plants. And so we see this wide range of diversity and all these elements have to be anticipated in the design of an indoor growing room. And so what we do is uh, we see how these elements come together. Um, and what we, what we really see is we can create a highly uniform environment uh, so that all the plants within that environment are growing at the same rate and they're maturing at the same time throughout the room. So whether it's the back corner or the front of the room, everything is maturing at the same rate. So you get that uniformity, not only of yield and, and outcome, but also in the specific properties of the plant. And one of the ways that we see that varying from room to room is how different people handle airflow. So we look at how um, to direct air in different directions to accommodate the different growing systems that the grower is going to choose. In general, we, we, try, we strive for uh, a very uniform and laminar flow of air, but often 
it's the way the growing system is configured, we have to work around that as well. So the diversity of the growing techniques has a big impact on how the rooms are ultimately designed. Thank you very much. And let me just come to the next question about growing rooms or how to fill, fulfill uh, the standardization best way. Cem, mm -hmm. um, what do you think, what do you foresee the upcoming trends in the new, near future regarding automa automa automation and uh, standardization in the grow room? Mm. There is so much innovation happening in the, in, in the world and in, in the sector. Um, my expertise is more airflow, uh, water usage, and um, air circulation, actually, like my Michael mentioned, and how we can extract the water that the plants are transpiring, and how we can reuse uh, the energies uh, inside, as in latent energy. And um, it's, it's also, uh, as, uh, as automation, it's now I'm seeing that um, there are lots of automation in benches, there's automation in, in everything now, but um, IoT is a very important uh, part of the design. I think everything should uh, collect data and you should be able to see how well your automation is working and the outcome. Because doing the automation is something, but also, uh, Seeing the outcome positively, it's so important what you use for what automation. So um, I guess it's, it's something to do with, with, uh, with the idea of the grower, what, what exactly they want to achieve. And it, then you can, you can use the automations um, regarding to the topics they want. Um, when we first met today, um, you had uh, you told me a very interesting detail. I have never heard so much about yet because I know that the humidity, the humidity in the grow rooms is a big problem, and you found a way to suck out the humidity out of the air, kind of. Yeah. So we patented. That's kind of very new and. Uh, yeah. And that. We patented a way to basically discharge latent energy. Uh, usually, the uh, systems around the world they they. Uh, convert uh, latent energy, which is the secret energy inside the grow chambers, into sensible heat. So there is there is always an unwanted heat inside. So what we do is we don't challenge this. We just discharge it outside with another medium we use, which is a liquid desiccant. And uh, this, is, this is how we actually reduced operation costs. This is how we control total humidity and temperature. And this is how we also recycle the water that we capture inside the grow house and reuse it in irrigation. It's kind of a clo nearly closed system. Yes. Very interesting. Thank you. And my next uh, question goes to Pete. Uh, Pete, you're also a shop owner. So how important is standardization of the products for your business and your customers from a shop owner's perspe perspective? Uh, a great question. So, and I think we've kind of talked about that in some of these environmental control uh, questions also. So we are looking to standardize all the time. We are looking to strive to that place where every time we harvest a certain genetics that we get the same results. Do we do that every time? Well, of course not, because everything changes almost on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. Uh, air changes, uh, humidity changes, sunlight changes, uh, artificial lighting changes, CO2 content changes. But to the best of our ability, as, as much as we can, with our environmental controls, with our knowledge about growing cannabis, that is what we try to achieve, where all of our plants are growing as standard or as close to being standard as possible. Thank you very much. And in that context, my next question goes to Michael. Um, Pete just told us about uh, uh, humidity in the grow room and other critical um, uh, uh, climate uh, climate control and what are the, the the critical design elements that must be considered in any growing environment I mean you design the room so how do you achieve that how what do you have to put in any room right I think I leapt to the answer to that question in the in the last time I spoke uh, so I won't repeat too much other than of course lighting 
Uh, temperature and humidity are the big factors that need to be controlled, in an, especially in, an indoor, in any environment, of course, but uh, particularly in an indoor environment. Um, but what I, what I was, uh, wanted to leverage that into is just following on from Pete talking about hitting standards uh, in, by controlling the environment, that whether it's greenhouse or indoor. Um, one of the things that we see, especially from the, in the experience in Canada, is, and also in the States, but there is a lot of testing, a lot of uh, hurdles that, ha that every product has to go through. And so it's not as though there's no standardization uh, requirements, but when, as the uh, industry becomes more and more competitive, I think that growers are gonna be looking for more ways to standardize the way they differentiate their product. Not just passing the tests of safety and health and making sure all the micro, micro, microbial counts are uh, where they should be, but also if you find a way to differentiate your product from uh, the perspective of taste, smell, or experience, then you want to be able to dial that recipe into your operation. And so having that ability, whether it's you're doing a greenhouse grow or more particularly an indoor grow, you want to have that ability to control the light, the spectrum, the intensity, to manage the humidity properly, and also to be able to control all those other things like additive CO2 and all your nutrients as well. Thanks. And um, Colin, you also know a lot about um, uh, setting up the, 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 the whole the environment for the plants and um, there are a lot of regulations where you, uh, where you have your business. So in how far do the different regulations in different states and different countries facilitate or hinder your business? That's a pretty fun topic and that makes my job pretty fun as I go everywhere I go it's a, it's a new puzzle to solve. Every state in the US has different regulatory pressures so to speak if it's chemical or microbial and it's really important for those growers to be able to, to follow those. I think overall it's standard there's testing labs and, and growers can, can follow that. I think the, the real challenge with cultivation in general is mitigating variability. And what you want to do, and this is what we've been talking about more than anything else, I think, while we're up here, is consistency, repeatability, and reducing variability so you can dial in the same product time and time again. And if growers can do that, I think that's the biggest challenge. And we talk about, you know, you can use a, a simple phenotype formula. What we're dealing with is precision agriculture, and everything should be defined as precise as possible always. And that's a simple phenotype formula, maximizing our plant quality and yield to the ideals that we want based on dialing in our plant genetics over time, our environment and inputs over time. And that's critical, but one thing that people overlook pretty bad in many cases is, is workflow and turnover because people create variability. And there's a lot of costs associated with workflow that's underestimated and a lot of error and variability that's introduced into growing because of that. And so not only do we have to dial in all these technical details in the infrastructure and climate and repeatable inputs, but we have to have our SOPs in place and we have to dial in how we're growing so we're not wasting a lot of time and a lot of money. I've worked in some groves that were very efficient that had three growers. And I've worked with other groves that didn't seem very efficient that were about the same size that had 20. That's a huge cost. And then that variability and turnover is it's just incredible. And it creates a, a lot of error with, with respect to the, pro, the end product over time. Is there any regulation you prosper from except that it's legal? I think we all prosper from regulation. It's, it's important. I think that there's some regulation. The, the challenge with regulations is the regulators aren't growers. They're typically just are not chemists. They're people that are following the rules and are getting informed and sometimes getting informed from people that aren't that informed. And so when you look at some of these rules and regulations, they're, they're generalities that, that create a lot of pressure and, and extra cost for cultivators. And I think it's important at this stage because this plant, this crop is way more regulated than any other food crop in the world. 
However, it's consumed very differently than any other food crop in the world, and I understand those pressures. You talk to the health department in Colorado, for example, we're very concerned about pesticide use. There's a lot of pesticide use and it's regulated heavily. The same pesticides are used on a lot of food crops that's not regulated heavily, but we aren't combusting potatoes when we consume them or combusting this plant. We're not extracting and concentrating potato extract where we are with this plant. And even non-trace amounts of some chemicals can concentrate into, into potentially toxic amounts. And so this is a very different beast and health and regulators in general are treating it very thoughtfully right now. And so I think it's important to work with regulators and educate them to understand where these thresholds of true risk are versus education opportunities to, to mitigate that. Okay, thank you very much. That's quite interesting because uh, we don't have all that here in Germany because we don't have production. Yet. You will. <laughs> we know, but we don't have that experience yet. Yeah. Uh, so um, my next question goes to Chem. Chem, your family's experience in agriculture all over the world, being, building up greenhouses. So we did not uh, talk about uh, feeding the plants yet. And I know that uh, most people, most cannabis patients, want to have a clean product. In how far does a clean product and, uh, um, and um, biological uh, organic uh, growing fit together with a controlled environment? Is that possible to make an organic product, a 100% organic product in a controlled environment? Well, uh, the word organic is actually, um, it's a very general word, word I would say. Um, but it, it, of course it is possible. Uh, we've been working with um, the grow owners that are shooting for to be more organic, to, to use less water, to use uh, no pesticides, even to, even aquaponics is now very popular in Europe regarding even cannabis. Aeroponic growings, you see, so all of the mediums do change uh, with the type of growing systems that people are trying to have and achieve. But um, regarding standardization, it's important what, what outcome comes from these facilities. So I, I think time is still needed to actually see uh, what's going on. And I also think that data collection is really important regarding questions like this, because um, you need to prove as well how you achieved it. It's not just how you uh, did it, but you need to be able to show what, what was your environmental conditions, how you actually got into producing something okay. more organic. Um, thanks, and let's just go deeper into it. An additional question, how do you achieve that? How do you document that? You, you make a documentation about your, uh, your progresses. And um, well, we have a, a software that keeps track of anything, any electrical equipment inside your facility. So you can go back a, a year, back to any month, to any hour, to any day. And you can monitor a single plant with it, for example? Yeah, you can even monitor a single plants with grief um, leaf. Um, there, is, there is many automations and many systems where you can collect data from. It's up to how many sensors you have. We, we usually use 35 sensors in, a, in a one, one room. Um, and you can basically go to any time of your grow facility and see what your condition was, was in and, and prove it, to be honest. So this is also documentation. It's also a very, very important part of standardization, ain't it? It is. I, I hate to interrupt, but we're almost... It's me. Hello. Hello. I'm right here in the front. Hello. No. <laughs> yeah, I just yeah. want to... Uh, I'm hard to notice. A, f a very, very last question to okay. Pete. Because I saved this question till the end, and it's a slightly controversial question, and you have the most experience from everybody here. You are uh, a long time in the cannabis scene and fought for legalization. And my general question to you is a little bit controversial, but how much regulation does cannabis need? I think it needs a lot at the end of the day. Um, and the reason I say that is because we want to embrace the public, and we want the public to be our uh, our partners in this. Without the public, without the guy that's your neighbor and the guy that's across the street from you, um, we don't 
we don't succeed at this. At the end of the day, um, we have to have the general public say this is going to be safe. This is going to be something that we can consume without being hurt. It has to be something that is not going to affect our children. So if we embrace uh, standardization, if we embrace regulation, that is our best way forward. And I can't stress that enough. And from folks that are going to be part of this industry, it really sets us apart. It sets us apart on so many different levels. But more than anything, it makes us better at what we do. Because the more regulations we have, the better we'll be at this. Thank you very much. Thank I you. think that was a nice final word. Is there any time for questions? Yeah, we have maybe cool. two or three minutes. We're going to start here, and then uh, we'll see if we can get over here. Um, Colin, uh, I didn't hear much detail about uh, microbial or biodynamic or alternatives to fertilizers. Can, can you expand on that a bit? Yeah, what in, works? in brief, and we can talk more about it offline. Actually, microbials are the quickest growing agriculture segment within all industries because we understand that microbes and interacting microbes in soil and substrates help maximize nutrient use efficiency. So it's critical. We also know, and you talk to a lot of growers specifically for this industry, it's becoming very popular in the United States. I mean, quickly, I started my company a couple years ago, and now we're uh, we, we just got product of the year in the UK. We're in over 800 shops in the US. We're in over 100, a couple hundred shops in Europe and all through South America because microbes have expanded. Even two years ago, I had to educate everyone. That's, that's my job is education and support like it was at the university as a PhD microbiologist. It's the same thing now, but I'm focused on the cannabis industry and educating growers now. It's important. I think you know plants in nature don't exist without microbial interactions none and so interacting and bringing those microbial processes and interactions back into precision agriculture i think does a lot not only to maximize value as far as yield and quality but to bring these interactions that might not be present to the degree that they need to be to maximize again the plant's ability to express some of these quality factors that we really see if you add microbes into uh, a grow we see the improved terpene profiles and improved yields. And so this quality metric really goes up along with, with yield. And so there's a lot of value that we think that we can bring in general across all agriculture segments by incorporating microbes, not replacing fertilizers. I don't think that's what we're trying to do. And I don't think that's realistic in some soil environments where there is a buildup of, of nutrients, you can actually really reduce fertilizer inputs and, 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 and replace them with microbial solutions. But in precision agriculture, you're never going to displace completely fertilizer applications. You're going to complement nutrients with microbe life, with microbial functionality. Hello. Uh, my question is for you as well. Um, are you thinking about using microorganisms for pest control as well, um, especially since we heard uh, California has such great problems with pesticides, like yeah, killing one fungi with another fung uh, other fungi might be a good idea. Uh, are you searching for that? Yeah, we are. We think that's a, a really interesting solution because there are so many problems in this industry in particular with, with chemical solutions. And growers in general are really limited to the solutions they have to control pests, and pests are a huge problem russet mites, spider mites, powdery mildew, depending on where you are, fungal gnats. There's a lot of problems, especially in monocrops and controlled environments. And if we don't have the right solutions, it's, there's a lot of value to control those. And controlling those naturally is important. So we still have resources at Colorado State University. We have several 5,000 square foot greenhouses and a 62 acre farm that we grow cannabis on all to for agriculture research purposes. So we can look for new solutions, not only for new you know, nutrient or bio stimulant solutions, but also for biocontrol solutions. And that's what you're talking about, bringing natural solutions for, for control aspects as well. So we absolutely think that's important and we are doing that. Um, yeah, uh, one of the stigmas that are often attached to cannabis is that it can cause psychosis, craziness, madness. I watched a documentary, uh, Blackfish, what happens when you take an orca out of its wild, natural environment. The more we take cannabis out of its natural environment, 
generations down the line, do you feel there could be a problem with increased psychosis with the more cloned, chemically fed, or, yeah, it's an unnatural environment, possibly create unnatural plants? You want to take that? Um, I, I, how can I answer that? I think that that's possible. I think that uh, you gen genetically modify any crop that, that you can run into unexpected outcomes. And since cannabis and especially active THC is psychotropic, is that a potential? It absolutely is a potential, I would say. Great, I think that's it. I think we're gonna leave it right there. Let's hear it for the panel once again. Give yourselves a round of applause for coming out. That concludes the second annual International Cannabis Business Conference right here in Berlin. You can still get tickets for Vancouver, which will be in June. And then we are going to be in Portland, Oregon in September. So come to that as well. Thank you very, very much. We really, really appreciate it. On behalf of Alex Rogers and everyone else at the International Cannabis Business Conference, Auf Wiedersehen.